your Bibles are uh, with you, would you please open them to 2 Samuel chapter 1. We're beginning a brand new book tonight, although it's really just a continuation of what we've been in, 1 Samuel. So it doesn't feel like we're starting a new book, but we are. We just finished 1 Samuel 31. We're going straight into 2 Samuel. Title of our message tonight is called How to Be Free from Bitterness. How to Be Free from Bitterness. I want to read to you a little story it's indicative of what happens in the Smith family household every night. Mom and dad were watching TV when mom said, I'm tired. It's getting late. I'm going to go to bed. So she went to the kitchen to make sandwiches for the next day's lunches. She rinsed out the popcorn bowls and took meat out of the freezer for supper the following evening. She checked the cereal box levels and filled the sugar container. She put spoons and bowls on the table and started the coffee pot for brewing the next morning. She then put some wet clothes in the dryer. She put a load of clothes into the wash, ironed a shirt, and secured a loose button. She picked up the newspaper strewn about on the floor. She picked up the game pieces left on the table and put the telephone book back in the drawer. She watered the plants. She emptied the wastebasket and hung up a towel to dry. She yawned and stretched and headed for the bedroom. She stopped by the desk and wrote a note to the teacher and counted out some cash for a field trip and pulled a textbook out from hiding underneath the chair. She signed a birthday card for a friend and addressed and stamped an envelope and wrote a quick note for the grocery store. She put both near her purse. Mom then washed her face, put on moisturizer, brushed and flossed her teeth, and trimmed her nails. Her husband called out and said, I thought you were going to bed. She said, I'm on my way. She put some water in the dog's dish and put the cat outside, then made sure all the doors were locked. She looked in each of the kids, or she looked in on each of the kids and turned the bedside lamp, uh, turned out the bedside lamp. She hung up a shirt, threw some dirty socks in the hamper, and had a brief conversation with one of the teenagers who was still awake. She then set the alarm, laid out her clothes for the next day, straightened up the shoe rack, and added three things to her list of things to do tomorrow. About that time, the husband clicked off his phone, set it on the nightstand, and said to no one in particular, I'm going to bed. And he did. I don't know about your house, but often that's how it works in ours. Robin works tirelessly around the house, and one thing that I've now learned after our years of being married is that she appreciates it when I help out around the house. She loves it. Your question is, now then, why don't you do it? And that's a good question. <laughs> I do. But one of the things we learned along the way in marriage is that, you know, if she doesn't tell me a lot of these things, and I just said, you know, I, I get in my own world at home, and I don't think about those kinds of things all the time, and most of the time, she's already taken care of it anyway. And so my mindset when I'm home is I'm shutting down from a long day at the church. My, my, my brain is, you know, I'm going into sort of, relax and I want to just sort of separate. I kind of want to just escape in my mind and watch YouTube or do something at home. And, and Robin is busy all day doing stuff. And what happens in, 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 in our relationship is that, you know, when I pull away, when I just use home as a place to come home and relax, then she begins to sort of get bitter about why aren't, you know, I don't help out. And she doesn't often say these things out loud, but she feels them. And it builds up and builds up in her heart. And then one day I make some sort of callous, you know, statement like, why did you wash my shirt? And then it all comes out. Right? And you know how this works. I have no idea what's going on. I know why she's so angry. Sometimes it's things like that and marriage things, and most of us can relate to that because these are how we operate in relationships. You can be clueless, and one person can sort of build up resentment over time and bitterness. But oftentimes when we talk about bitterness, it's due to some sort of event that has happened in life that, that was either, you know, pretty traumatic um, or, or you've been wronged in some major way. And, and because of this, you've struggled with it because it inflicted so much pain and so much hurt that even probably right now as I'm speaking, you're thinking about it. It's coming up in your mind and, and, and now it's at the forefront. And, and when this happens, we're sort of left with this, how do I deal with it? What do I do with this? And, you know, in Christianese, we say, well, just let it go or give it to God or, you know, we have some sort of, uh, you know, sort of 
some sort of unemotional platitude that we just sort of throw out there, right? Well, you just need to pray, and you just need to do this. And, and for some of us, as I'm saying this to you, you've heard these things, and, and, and you're already sort of feeling like, okay, but I've done that, right? But it's still here, and it still hurts, and it's still pain, right? So what do we do, and how does the Bible deal with it? Well, let's just review a little bit of where we've been walking with King David and his relationship with King Saul, who was king at the moment. Now remember, when all this took place, David was a young man. Saul had been anointed king, and he was humble when he was first anointed king. And he was good at first. He was the very first king of Israel. But the circumstances by which he became king was not great. Remember, the nation was rejecting God as their king, as their leader. And they wanted a man to lead them. And God sort of gave them this warning about, hey, listen, if you want a man to lead you, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, sure enough, he anointed Saul. He was good. He was the people's choice. He looked very kingly square jaw, tall, good looking, and, you know, and, and, and he had sort of this leadership stature, you might say, and the people said, that's the guy, that's who we want. The problem is, is that Saul didn't stay humble for very long, right? As soon as he became king and he had a little bit of victory, especially in ministry, he was sent out uh, to, to defeat uh, an army that invaded Israel. He had some success, and once he did, he started getting puffed up in himself. He started, you know, becoming less reliant on God and more reliant upon himself, and he became a little bit more insecure because that's what happens when we get super self-focused. Somebody came around later on because of Saul's failure to obey God and take out the Amalekites, as he had been told. Samuel, the prophet, went over and anointed David, who was a man after God's own heart. This was now God's choice. Problem, David's a young man. He's not going to be king yet. Yet he's been anointed king. He's not king yet. Saul is still king. So there's now there's going to be this process of time, roughly 20 years, where Saul is still king, even though the kingdom has been torn from him. And David is going to be king, and yet he's not king yet and having to submit to this evil ruler. And then, of course, you remember the whole David and Goliath incident. Goliath was this Philistine, and David took him out. And, and when this happened... They wrote a new hit song, and you couldn't go anywhere within, in Israel without hearing it. It was Saul had slain his thousands, and David had slain his ten thousands. And when you do those kinds of things in front of an insincere and, and, and very insecure king, now he sort of takes it personal, and he puts David out of his sight. And, and, and over the course of 1 Samuel, uh, the latter half of the book, it's really a story of repetition. It's Saul, who is you know, knows that David is going to be king and, and the spirit of God has left him and now he's sort of walking in sin and darkness. He continues to try and kill David by throwing spears at him. He hired hitmen to go get him. He sent an army after him and he kept coming up short. But, but, but meanwhile, David lost his job. He lost his house. He lost his family. He had people out to get him everywhere he went. There were opportunists that wanted to get in good with Saul, that didn't love the Lord, that didn't walk with God, and they were going to, and they continually turned David in. So a life on the run, constantly. And he lost so much. Now, take David's story, and let's, let's remember something together here for a moment, because this is important. This is not a Disney movie, right? This is not a made-for-TV drama. This is, this is a real story. King David was a real man. King Saul was a real man. And all the players in our story, this is historical. And, and as a person, as a man, and, and you, as, as, you know, as, as a human being, we can relate to this kind of hardship. Maybe, maybe you haven't lost your job because somebody you know, was evil. Maybe you haven't, or maybe you have. Maybe you were abused as a child. Maybe you're being abused right now. Maybe you have you know, been cheated or left or, or, or you know, these things have happened. I would submit to you, and this is for comparison purposes, that probably no one in here could sit down and brag about their hurt story in front of David. David says, oh yeah, well, I lost my job, my house, my, you know. You know. He has literally the, the, the saddest country song that can ever be written, right? He lived it out. And it got so bad for David that he actually had decided at one point that he kind of lost faith in God. He lost faith in God's promise. He didn't believe any longer he got discouraged, like many of us do. He dealt with it for so long, and he was finally so fed up with it that he just kind of gave up on God's promises, and he just said, you know what? There's nothing better for me than to just go and live with the Philistines, and so he did. He joined the Philistines, the eternal enemies of God, and he went and lived with them, and then he lied, and he compromised about who he, he was out robbing people and killing them and taking their stuff and bringing it back to the king of Gath, 
and telling him that he was robbing the Hebrews. And I mean, this is a really, you know, this is, this is King David who we're talking about. This is not what he's exactly known for, but this is who he was at the time. He lost faith in God, and he went out and started living foolishly. Fortunately, God didn't let that get too far. But David humbled himself. Why? Because when he was rejected by the Philistines, when he turned to the world for help and the world didn't help him, he was rejected by the Philistines. He suffered hardship when the Amalekites came through and into Ziklag, which was his town, and took his wives and all of their possessions. And then his own friends wanted to kill him, the men who were following him. And he finally, it says, it strengthened himself in the Lord. And he came back and he got right with God. Now, this is sort of like that pivotal part in the story where this is where everything changes. Right? For you, you may have lived a life of hardship. You may have lived a life of rejection and pain. And you've had this bitterness sort of well up inside of you and this anger and frustration. And you still, to this day, don't know what to do with it. And it's just there. And maybe you've raised your hand and you've been saved. And you've given your life to God. And surely he's done things in your heart and in your life. But this is the area. This is the door that you don't want to open. God wants to open that door tonight. He wants to lay it exposed. He wants to expose it and lay it bare. And he wants to deal with it in your heart and in your life right now. I'm, I'm glad you're here tonight, because if I would have told you what the sermon was about two hours ago, you probably wouldn't be here, right? But the Lord brought you here tonight because tonight he wants to set you free from this, and he wants to fill your heart with joy, the joy of your salvation that Neil brought up there after the last song and service. He wants to bring you back to that place of grace and of love and of mercy, and truly, we're going to see that with King David tonight, and we're going to ask ourselves, how did he do that? and simultaneously answer the question. If your Bibles are open, 2 Samuel chapter 1. It says, Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had stayed two days in Ziklag, that on the third day, behold, it happened, that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, Where have you come from? So he said to him, I've escaped from the camp of Israel. Then David said to him, how did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, the people have fled from battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this night. We thank you for this time. Lord, as we've come here tonight, Lord, to, to, to sit before you, Lord, and to study your word and to, to open ourselves up to you, Lord, our hearts, Lord, and let you see into those places that we don't even want to acknowledge are there. But Heavenly Father, as we do this, Lord, I pray that you'll be gentle with us, Lord, that you will be kind, that you will be loving, Lord, and merciful and, and full of grace, Lord, that you will, Lord, speak to us tonight and that you will begin to heal these wounds that have been open for so long. Lord, I pray that you will free us, Lord, from this bitterness tonight, this resentment of soul, Lord, the clouds... Our judgment makes our decisions, Lord, and, and, and really just clouds our view of, of life in general. Father, restore to us the joy of salvation. Bring us, Lord, closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we pick up now where, where David, remember, he wasn't allowed to fight with the Philistines. They rejected him from it. And, and, you know, this was after he strengthened himself in the Lord. God sent him and said, you know, go pursue the Amalekites. Remember, he ran into the Egyptian that they had discarded because he was sick. And he told them where they were, and he went with them and showed them. And David caught up to the Amalekites. He wipes them out. He gets all of his possessions back and all of his stuff. And then they make it back to Ziklag. And when they, you know, they're back in Ziklag. And, and, and David knew that the battle between the Philistines and the nation of Israel has already fought. He was almost going to fight on the Philistine side. Right? So he knows probably that the battle's already done, and he's already back in Ziklag. And when he gets back there... This young man ran all the way from the battle to David. Now, he had to leave the land of Israel, and he had to know where David was at. Right? So this young man, he knows right where David is, and he runs all the way from the battlefield. This, must, this guy must have been like a world-class runner, because it's, it's quite a few. Well, let's just face it. I'd die if I had to run to the end of the driveway. Okay, so, I mean, I listen to this, and I'm like, man, this dude must have lived a different life. So... When he gets there, though, David would have immediately known that something was wrong. When he gets there, his, his clothes are torn, and he has dust on his head. And this is sort of an ancient way of showing mourning. They would rent, they call it rent their clothes. They would literally tear their clothes. Now, you know, they didn't have clothes like we do. They didn't have a closet full of clothes. You only had a few sets of clothes, and they were valuable, and you needed to wear them. So to tear them was, it was a sign of mourning, that, that, that even your most valuable possessions didn't mean that much to you anymore. So they would tear their clothes, they would put the dust on their head, it was sort of traditional. And so David knows probably at this point the battle didn't go well. 
Something's wrong. So he gets there, he falls down. David says, you know, where'd you come from? He tells him, I came from the camp. He says, well, you know, how did it go? Please tell me. Now, I just imagine that after this man ran all that way, David probably let him catch his breath, probably had, you know, somebody get him some water, sat him down, let him sit there. But David was immediately like, hey, okay, man, tell me, how did the battle go? Well, he gets the answer that he kind of probably already knew in his heart. The people have fled from battle. Many of the people have fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. He gets word. Now, just real quick, quick poll. If Saul had tried to kill you many times, tried to assassinate you using other people, sending spies, and people had turned you over to him, and you've already lost your job, your family, your home, and everything you ever cared for, and you just found out that that person was killed, how would you feel? Might be popping a champagne court. I mean, you know, you might be, you might be just, wow, okay. You might be so excited. Not champagne. I'm thinking of that. What's that stuff they serve at Thanksgiving? It's like, it's bubbly, but it's not. Martinelli's, that's what I was thinking. Of. I said champagne, but I'm, that's, not, that's, that's not good. We don't. <laughs> Immediately had in my mind that vision, of, you know, like when somebody's up on a podium and they're spraying it all over each other. Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say, right? Good, good. Martin Ellis, thank you. I'm going to write that one down. So he comes there, and David now hears the news that, that he wanted to hear, probably. That you would think, that you would, you would think David wanted to hear this. He's probably looking forward to this. Now I can come home. Now I can take the throne that was rightfully given to me. Now I can stop running for my life. Now I can finally start walking in the role that God has laid out for me for these many years. But first, David investigates a little bit. He says to the young man, verse 5, So David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? And the young man who told him said, As I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear. And indeed, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me. And I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? So I answered and said, I am an Amalekite. So he said to me again, please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, for my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them here to my Lord. So this is the confirmation. David says, how do you know? Now he tells him this story about coming upon Saul on Mount Gilboa, and then, you know, finding him sort of leaning on a spear and, and, and begging him to sort of finish him off, right? And so he says, so I did it. I stood over and I killed him and I took his crown and I took his bracelets. And in a bracelet, you know, people would have known that it was, belonged to Saul. So if he showed up with the crown and bracelet, how do I know he's dead? Here's his crown, here's his bracelets, right? And this is how I got him. And so the young man tells this story, this young Amalekite. But there's a problem with this story. Is it doesn't jive with the scripture that we already have. The story that he tells is what he says happened. But the scriptures, now if we compare a story with scripture, what we come up with is that this young man was probably lying, most likely lying. Now there's a small possibility he wasn't, but what did we read in chapter 31 of 1 Samuel? We read that Saul was in battle. The night before, he was already told he was going to lose. Remember, he consulted a medium. The medium, you know, brought up Samuel, and we found this weird situation where Samuel's talking to him, and Samuel says, by, by, you know, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be in the afterlife with me, buddy. You die, you're going to die, and your sons are going to die. So he already knew that. So in battle, it says, Saul got struck by many arrows. He was pierced through, and he was dying, and he didn't want to be captured and tortured by the Philistines. And so he actually told his armor bearer, hey, kill me. Right? His armor bearer would not. He said, no, I, you know, he was terrified. He says he wouldn't do it. So Saul fell on his sword. Now, here's where, here's where the scriptures get interesting. In chapter 31, it says, when the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell on his sword also. So a cursory glance at that scripture says, wait a second now. If there were an armor bearer there that was standing next to Saul, would he have let an Amalekite come up and kill him? No. Would not have let that happen. Is it possible that the guard didn't know that Samuel was, or that Saul was dead? 
highly unlikely. Possible, but highly unlikely. Like I said, when, they, when these men fought in battles, when they killed somebody, they were within a sword's length away. They saw their eyes, they heard their screams, they got their blood on themselves. These men were well acquainted with death. Remember, they didn't go to Taco Bell like we do, right? All of us, right? They had to kill their own meal every time they made something, that they killed a fatted calf. These men were well acquainted with death. It's not hard to tell when somebody's dead. Chances are, what really happened was, this young Amalekite happened to be on Mount Gilboa, saw that Saul was dead, and then he took his crown and his, and his bracelets. He knew exactly where David was. He knew the promise. Everybody in Israel knew that David was promised to be king. And he thought, here's my opportunity. I'm going to take off the crown, I'm going to take off the rings, and I'm going to make up this whole story about how I put him out of his misery because he told me to. And, and David is going to love me because I took out his enemy and I'm the one that did it. And, and I'm going to anoint him king because, you know, here's your crown. I did this for you, David. Now what do I get in return? Now, I'm sure this is what this Amalekite, this young man was probably thinking. This is how it works in the world, right? He probably thought he was going to get land and, and, and be second in command, and he probably was dreaming. He probably smiled to himself all the way from Mount Gilboa all the way over to Ziklag and Philistine land, thinking about the things he's going to get. So he tells David, that's what I did. I killed him. Once again, let's, let's sort of pause here for a moment. Upon hearing this, how would you feel? How would you feel if this were you? Well, look at David's reaction. Verse 11 says, Therefore, David took hold of his own clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for, listen, Saul and for Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Did you see that? Would that be your reaction? If your sworn enemy who has been trying to kill you and has taken everything from you and hates you and has spread lies and rumors about you, you find out that person got what they deserve, so to speak, would you mourn for them? Would you weep for them? Would you cry because of what happened to them? Would you fast because of it? Would you tear your own clothes in a sign of mourning? Or would you invite your friends over and order some pizzas and ding dong, the witch is dead? You see, because I would fall more toward the latter, wouldn't I? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't that, that's kind of where our flesh wants to go, right? Can you imagine now, and most of you can, because I brought it up in the, in the, in the introduction now, that thing that you're bitter about. Right? You already feel it. You feel it in your throat, maybe as I'm speaking. You, you feel that bitterness rising back up again because you're thinking about the pain or the injustice that's happened to you, and you sat with that for a long time. And, and, and the Bible tells us that, that, that this leads to what's called a root of bitterness. And that bitterness is inside of you. You don't want it to be there. You don't even want to admit that it's there, but it is. And it's burning away. Did you know that bitterness in your heart is like drinking poison yourself but expecting the other person to die? It doesn't hurt them. It hurts you. David didn't have this. How do we know? Because when he found out that Saul was dead, he wept, he mourned, he wrote, he rent his clothes, and he fasted. That is not the reaction I would expect, especially from David for having dealt with this for 20 years. There's only one way that can be possible, and that's the Lord. Somehow David had forgiven Saul. Somehow God had dealt with all of the bitterness in David's heart that you know at one point existed. He was depressed. He had fallen away. Somehow, God had restored David's joy of his salvation from the very beginning of knowing the Lord. God did that somehow. We're going to discover how in a moment, but this is, this is the reaction of a man who is free from bitterness. He actually wept over Saul. You know what's interesting about that too? Saul never repented. You know that? Saul went to his grave never admitting that he'd done anything wrong to David, probably even justifying it. When he was bleeding out from the arrows, asking someone to kill him, he never cried out to God. He never had a deathbed confession. He never poured his heart out. He went, even though he was told by a medium the night before, even by God had, had used that situation, 
God told him, you have basically 24 hours to live. And what did he do? He whined a little bit, picked himself up, ate some food, went out and died in battle. Never repented. So that's, that's not a necessary ingredient for forgiveness. I just want to point that out because we're going to come back to that. So you can sort of imagine this young man telling this story and David, he sees the morning, he sees all this, and he's probably thinking, oh, yeah, David's the politician. He's got to show everybody how sad he is. You notice everybody else did it too. And, you know, behind the scenes, he's going to slip me a big wad of cash, and, you know, he's going to give me that position I'm looking for. And David says to the young man, verse 13, where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien and a Malachite. Isn't that a funny thing to read? I'm a son of an I am the son of an alien. I'm guessing that's how he did it, but... Verse 14, this is where it all stops for him. And so David said to him, how was it you are not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Ooh, you can imagine, I bet you the color drained out of his face at this point, at this point. Now, I want to go back to the book of Numbers in chapter 12. If you've got your Bible with you, you can flip back with me a few books. Numbers chapter 12 just to see the seriousness of what he had done or what he had at least said that he had done. If you're back there, uh, Numbers chapter 12. This is a little situation that happened in the wilderness when Moses was leading the largest camping trip ever. It was over a million people. Forty years they camped out in the wilderness. Didn't have to be that long, but because of their rebellion against God, it ended up there. But this little incident took, took place then. Verse 1 says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now Miriam is Moses' Moses' sister. Aaron is his brother. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Ooh, wait a second. So what's going on here? Miriam and Aaron are forming a little bit of a conspiracy. They're trying to undermine Moses. Moses is who God called, right? God called Moses. He put Moses in charge. So God is the one that put Moses there, right? Now, Miriam and Aaron have decided we've had enough of Moses' leadership. We don't like the way he does things. Well, God doesn't just speak through Moses. He speaks through us as well. So now they're leading a little uprising, a little rebellion. But listen, (laughs) this this has got to be the scariest verse in the Bible. And God heard it. verse 3 says now the man Moses was very humble more than all the men who are on the face of the earth man how would you like it if that was written about you isn't that cool suddenly the Lord said to Moses Aaron and Miriam come out you three to the tabernacle of the meeting so the three came out this is like a this is like a dad calling the kids out huh like the kids are talking in the bedroom or something like that dad hears it be like hey you three get out of here right God calls him out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak to him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Whoa. Miriam and Aaron, normal prophets I only speak to through visions or dreams and sometimes in dark sayings. But when Moses is around, me and him, we're, we're tight. I speak to him face to face and plainly. We have conversations. Why on earth did you think that you could usurp? And basically what God is saying, why did you think you could usurp my authority because he's, I put him in charge. Who do you think you are? This is what God is saying to them. You have derailed when God is saying to you, who do you think you are, right? And sure enough, he says that. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward me. Let's call him something else. Let's call him, you know, let's call him Steve or something like that. I just notice that. And then Steve turned toward Miriam. How's that? We got any Steves out here tonight, maybe? I don't know. No, I'll call Miriam. 
You've got to take the good with the bad on this one, I guess. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh, my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us for which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when it comes out uh, of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. Now, same situation later on with David and Samuel. Notice, they were conspiring against Moses, right? And Moses was humble. This is why he's told that. So when it happened, now we know who the instigator was because God was the one that punished Miriam, made her a leper. Now, she, she was only a leper for seven days, and she was healed, and she was restored. But she was the one that got the bigger punishment. So we know she was the instigator. Aaron sort of just, you know, he went along with this, which was foolish. Um, and so, you know, but it's interesting that Moses is the one that prays for their healing, isn't it? Because he was the one that it was directed against. But the point of this is clear. God is saying, that is my Moses. I put him there, and I can take him out of there. Now, fast forward. All the times that David could have killed Saul. There was two times in particular that he had easy access, and instead, what he did was he cut off a corner of his robe the first time and showed him, look, I got this. I could have killed you. Second time, he took a staff in his water bottle, and he held him up on a hill. Again, hey, I got these from right next to your head. I could have killed you. Neither time he did it. Why? And he prevented his own men from doing it. And he gives the same reason each time. Far be it from me to lift up my hand against the Lord's anointed. In other words, David trusted God so much and knew that God put him there and God can take him out of there. If I take matters into my own hands, essentially, I'm making a choice over God. And that is wrong. And David knows this. So this young Amalekite, who probably made up this story, but it was, instead of getting blessed, he gets something else. Then David, verse 15, called one of the young men and said, go near and execute him. And he struck him, so he died. Then David said to him, verse 16, your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Instant death sentence. No need for a trial, no need for a jury, no need for evidence. The man said it, and he got exactly what was coming to him. He did not get what he thought he was going to get. You know what's interesting about this story? Just a short point before we move on and get to our application here, because I find this fascinating. Did you notice that the young man, did you see his nationality? He's a Malachite. Who was Saul originally supposed to take out and refuse to do it, and because of that sin and rebellion against God, his position, his authority was taken out, although he stayed king for the next 20 years. God used it as a training ground now for David to make him king. But you know, there's, a, there's an illustration here, and I know it's a side point, so I'll be brief, but, but there's an illustration here. When Saul failed to deal with sin, right, the Amalekites are sort of representative of the flesh. He failed to deal with the flesh, and later on, that same flesh dealt with him. Because even if he didn't kill him, even if the Amalekite didn't kill him, he was the one that came and stripped off his armor. Of all the soldiers of Israel, it happened to be an Amalekite, and the order was to Saul, take them all out. This is God's divine judgment on a people who had rebelled against him, whose hearts were so cold toward him, and were sacrificing their, their own children. God ordered Saul to judge them, and he refused to judge them. This is, indi- you know, this is the same thing for us. When God tries to deal with a specific sin in our hearts, and our personal heart, those little cabinets inside of your heart that you don't want to open up, right, that God knows are there and you know they're there, but you don't want to deal with, and God says you need to deal with this, and you refuse, you refuse, you refuse, sooner or later, that will deal with you. That will deal with you. I knew a man years ago. He was a good friend of mine, and he had a porn addiction that nobody knew about, and, and he was... It became such a problem in his life that it, it started popping up when he was at work. And he had had so many instances where, where he was confronted on it from different, different people. And he just refused to deal with it, refused to deal with it, refused to deal with it. And someday, one day, I think something was on his computer and it ended up in the office and it was seen by everybody. And, and he finally dealt with him. And he lost his job and he walked away and you know, he was, sa- he was, he got saved through that. I mean, well, he was, he had gone to church before that, but that was really the time he laid his life down. He was fully restored. And I, you know, I, he's got, I think he's in a ministry now, actually. But he, but I never forgot that because I was, because he always said that I refuse to deal with it. I refuse to deal with it. And then finally it dealt with me. 
And I think, you know, this is something I think is just so indicative. Right here, we have that example, the Amalekite. He was ordered to take the Amalekites out, and when he's dead, who's stripping him of his armor? An Amalekite. Flesh, and then came back. So David deals with him. He executes justice. Then in verse 17, it says, David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and Jonathan his son, and he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. Okay, quick note on that. Um, the book of Jasher was brought up also in the, in, um, where was it? I think we already came across it. I think it's in the, I know it's in Chronicles, but it's referred to in the scriptures, the book of Jasher. Okay, now before you start thinking we're missing a book of the Bible, we're not. Okay, the Bible is referring to an ancient document that did contain some Hebrew scriptures, but it was also containing a lot of, of, of other stuff. So it was just an ancient document, the book uh, that the Bible refers to only for sake of comparison, I guess, probably for people of those days. But don't go searching for the book of Jasher as though, you know, somebody's holding out on you. The, the, scriptures, the, the scriptures are complete, okay? Our Bible is complete, and, and, and God has completed it. It is the inspired word of God. Uh, so there are no missing books here. Uh, it is canonized, and, and it is here for you. It's just something that's, that was referenced, and evidently the song was in it as well. So verse 19, so David writes, this is the song of the bow. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Let, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there. The shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put on ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war have perished. So David writes this song, and right away you can just kind of see these things. You're like, man, David, how can you write that? How could you call, how could you call Saul the beauty of Israel? The more like the scourge of Israel. You know, how, how can you say that? The mighty have fallen, yet Saul fell a long time before he died, right? And you could just kind of go through this. Yeah, I mean, now the enemies are rejoicing. The Philistines and Gath are going to rejoice because the Israelites are, you know, their, their enemies are finally getting, you know, thrown down. And there's just something interesting here. It says, O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain upon you, uh, nor fields of offering, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there. This curse of David, God is honored to this day. Uh, when we go to Israel, we go to a, a place called Beth Shen. And from Bet Shen, you can see Mount Gilboa. And Israel has now gone and planted a lot of forest on Mount Gilboa, but there's one side of the mountain where, where the battle took place where there's a line there. Nothing grows there. It's barren. There's nothing on there. Now, I'm told that um, because of the trees that were planted now, that, that sometimes there will be water that comes down and there's like wildflowers that bloom there and people have taken that and said, well, look at that. No, I mean, the Israelis are... <laughs> Basically, a lot of them are atheists nowadays, and, and, and you know, they, don't, they don't buy into this anyway. But, but, but it's very clear that when you're in the, the Jezreel Valley or the Valley Jordan Valley, when you look up at Mount Gilboa, one whole side is just barren. It's, it, even to this day, there's nothing that grows there. And, and it's because God honored this curse here. But he says, from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. Now, we can kind of understand, you know, his, his crying out for Jonathan. It was his best friend. You know, but when he says this, verse 23, Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives. It wasn't much about Saul that was pleasant, you know, but he writes it. And only somebody who's been completely free from bitterness can see the good in somebody, even through that hatred, uh, the hatred that Saul had for him. And so he goes on and talks about the weeping, and, you know, and, and he starts talking about Jonathan. And, and, and I just want to make a note here on that because it's very important. This is not, not, not sexual. Okay, there's nothing in this verse that indicates anything about that. Um, you know, there's two things about this I just want to make a note of because, uh, number one, you know, men can have great relationships and be friends and have a brotherly love. And sometimes, you know, you can even have, you know, that, that tight sort of family love. You can have a best friend that you're super close to. That's one. 
Second of all, he says it's surpassing the love of women. Well, David didn't exactly follow God's prescription for marriage, right? He had multiple wives, you know? And like, I, David, I can't imagine why your marriages weren't all that good, you know? Two wives living in the same house and no shoe closet. I don't know how that would even work. I mean, it, sorry, I threw that out there. It's, you can imagine Solomon later, he had like 700 wives. I always think of like, he must have had like a shoe house, you know? It must have been like built on a hillside or something. Anyway, back to this. So David wrote this, and we see this now. Now, clearly we can see through David's writings and through his, his, his speech that there's no bitterness there. The question is now, how do we deal with it, and what do we do? Okay? There are three reasons that, that David was free from his bitterness. Reason number one, his heart was right with God. His heart was right with God. Okay, if you're trying to forgive somebody, and you're saying to yourself, I'm going to forgive them, and your heart is not, with, not right with God, good luck. Okay? Because what you're trying to do is get rid of an emotion that will never, that will never go away. Okay? When you are cut, you develop something called scar tissue. Right? And that scar tissue can heal, and it can even look normal. It can be sometimes almost unseen and heal completely, right? but it's still there. And, and, and so what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do something in the flesh that can only be accomplished through something spiritual. And you can only have that spiritual power when you are right with God. David was right with God. How do we know this? Because after he had gone to the land of Gath and was serving the king there and was living a life of compromise and everything fell apart when the Amalekites came while he was gone and took all of his stuff, it says David strengthened himself in the Lord. In other words, he repented and he returned. He got his heart right with God. He repented of his sin. And he returned to the Lord, and the Lord truly led him into victory. Now he's back at Ziklag, and he came to the Lord, and things are good. But God had supernaturally filled his heart. 1 Samuel 36 and 8. He said he had hit rock bottom. He strengthened himself in the Lord. Listen to this scripture from the New Testament. It adds a little bit more light to it. Acts 3.19 says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Notice that. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Right? You don't have those times of refreshing when you have not you know, repented of your sin and the sin still remains. When you're walking away from the Lord, you're walking in rebellion, you're not going to have spiritual victory. Luke 10, 27 says, Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Forgiving somebody is an act of showing love to them. It's forgetting the, forgiving the offense so relationship can be restored, but it's not necessary that the person repents, just like Saul. Saul didn't repent. So you can forgive without receiving that repentance from the other person, without them actually acting on their, uh, on their conviction. But, it, but, but notice where it started, where Jesus says this, love the Lord first with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I heard a story about leeches one time, about a guy who was uh, on a mission trip in the Amazon, and they crossed a river, and when he came out, he had these leeches on him. And that terrifies me. I just I don't know why God would create such an animal that would do such a thing. Um, but it was there, and, and when he got out of the river, he started to panic, and he was going to start pulling them all off. And the guide says, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. Because when you pull them off, there's a little part of them that sticks inside of your flesh, and it will get infected. You get really sick, and ultimately you'll die. And, and when I heard that, I thought to myself, that's, that's kind of like bitterness, right? If your heart's not right with God, and you just sort of pull these, you just try to deal with it, and just pull it out, well, then it leaves a wound, it gets infected, it doesn't help. But how did he get rid of these things? He said, well, he had to make this bath of this kind of salt. I guess it was like a solution. And he laid in it, and then the leeches will let go, and they'll just go away. Uh, you know, this is pretty cool because this is how you deal with these things is you soak in the goodness of God. You, you literally turn to God in both prayer, in both devotion time and word, spending time in fellowship with other believers, and God takes these things. They literally fall off and heals the wound itself. So his heart was right with God. Number two, the reason he was free from bitterness is that he understood grace. He understood grace. Grace was not a foreign substance to David. David had the promises of God. He had multiple victories in God where God preserved him and God protected him and God provided for him. And then he got discouraged and threw it all away or tried to. And God reached out to him in love. Is that not grace? That's undeserved favor, right? Why didn't God just anoint a new David? You know, why didn't he anoint somebody else and say, David, you done messed up, man. 
You were this close. You almost had it. You know, this was your training program. You got all the way to the final test and you failed. Sorry, somebody else now. Next. No. God loved David and God reached out to him and gave him that undeserved favor, just like you and just like me. I love that. I absolutely love that. You know, there's a parable about this in Matthew chapter 18 about this guy that was forgiven all this money when he owed it. And then he goes out and he finds another guy that owes him money. Can't pay him. So he beats him up. And then the king who he originally owed money to found out about it and then came back and threw him in jail because, you know, made him repay everything he owed him. And, 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 and the crux of the whole thing is this, that, that, you know, when you forgive, you've been forgiven much, and therefore you forgive other people. Like, the only way to give somebody else grace, honestly, because our flesh doesn't want to do it, is, is by starting and you remember the grace that God has given you. If you think that you deserved salvation then I'd love to have a conversation with you and we'll take a little trip through the Ten Commandments, right? And then we'll talk about God's judgment because truly you can't be saved until you know what you're being saved from. You, the first part of, you know, repentance of coming to the Lord is humility. It's understanding that you need salvation, right? It's bringing it to it. And, and, and truly the, the first step in getting healed from bitterness is acknowledging you have it, right? And then you come and then, you know, you, 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 you receive God's grace and then you move on from that. And God begins to heal you in your heart. But you have to understand God's grace before you can give God's grace because that is the last thing that leads to forgiveness. You know, do, you, do you hold other people to a different standard than yourself? If you do, then, then chances are you don't understand God's grace. David understood God's grace. David understood after he went to the Philistines when he strengthened himself in the Lord, when everything fell apart and God was with him and filled him up. He understood, number one, he really didn't deserve it. And number two, God is really, really good. Right? So the second reason... That he got gra- the, the second reason he was free from bitterness is he understood God's grace. The third reason is that David chose to forgive. I say chose to forgive because Saul never repented. He never asked for it. And, and forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a choice. You choose to forgive. And in fact, forgiveness is commanded. It is not suggested. Matthew 6, 14 tells us that if you forgive others, then you then will be forgiven. If you do not forgive others, then you will not be forgiven. It's an if-then thing. It's a pretty easy thing. When you understand God has forgiven you, then you have the ability then to forgive others. And I just want to sort of throw this out there because forgiveness doesn't mean a full restoration of boundaries. Right? There are people that have hurt me in my life, you know, and, and I can forgive, and, and truly they may have even repented but there still needs to be good boundaries because that person may be weak in an area. You know, I'm just thinking, and I'm going to throw out an example. If somebody has hurt your child, you know, and, and has truly repented, and, and you recognize the grace that God has given you, and you give them grace, and then you choose to forgive them, and you move past the offense and let God begin to work in your heart and restore you, that all that stuff can take place, okay? But that doesn't mean that that becomes my new babysitter, Right? There needs to be a proper boundary there. There needs to be some time of healing before you make those choices. And so when people say to me, well, you know, forgiveness means that you forget. You know, well, y- yes, you do. You forget the offense, but you still use wise boundaries. Right? Just make that known. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, then he is a new creation. God wants to create in you a new heart. A new heart that's free of bitterness, that's full of forgiveness and God's grace, And some of you tonight need to pour your heart out to the Lord. And you need to bring this to him. You need to repent of your unforgiveness. You need to repent of your lack of grace. You need to ask the Lord to come back into your heart to fill you with that grace and that love and that joy that you had when you first got saved. To to, to restore to you the joy of your salvation. And then ask him to deal in your heart with that forgiveness. That you want to forgive and you're going to try to forgive. And then truly, God will bring you to this place where you can look at that person who's hurt you and say the beauty of Israel or the beauty of that person and that they were actually pleasant. You can look at the good things about them. I know that seems impossible now, but our God is a God who can do anything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this night and this time. And and truly, Lord, for this message, uh, Lord, of healing that you want to do in the hearts of so many who are here. Lord, we know that this bitterness and unforgiveness is just a prison that we can live in and and even put on a good face and go to church and act good and and let everybody know that everything is fine but but this bubbles under the surface and sometimes it it even gets buried for a while but then comes up 
like a wall as soon as something in our life happens that just smells like it or seems like it's the same. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you will come into each and every person's heart tonight, that you will deal with this thing. And I pray, Lord, that they will have the courage to bring it to you, to lay their hearts bare before you, to ask you, Lord, into that place. Repent of it, Lord, and, and, and that you will forgive, Lord, and restore and then heal, Lord. That these things would fall off. They would stop sucking the life out of us, Lord. That they would stop uh, keeping us in these dark places, Lord, in chains, Lord. But that you will free us and bring us out into the light, Lord. That we would be great witnesses for you. That we would love you. And, Lord, that this would so separate us from a world that holds grudges, that says to get back and clap back at our enemies and put people down and show them where they're wrong. But, Father, let us be different and let the world see it, that they would desire you as well. We pray these things, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. God bless you. I love you all. I'll see you on Sunday at the Baptist Church.